Hello and welcome to another session in the Unlocking Archaeology series brought to you by the Southern African Archaeology Student Council. I'm Marie Harker, I'm Chair of the Council. With me today, fellow Council member Saramia Bansal and our special guest presenter for today, Justin Pargeter. He is from the African Paleosciences Lab at New York University. And over to you, Saramia, uh, for the full introduction. Thanks, Mariette. Welcome, Dustin. Welcome to our student attendees. Um, we are happy to have Justin from the New York University in US today here with us. Um, he is an assistant professor at the Department of Anthropology, member of Center of Study of Human Origins, and also leads the African Paleo Sciences Laboratory. Um, his research focuses on human biocultural evolution as tracked by the relationships between technology, cognition, and environmental changes in the Pleistocene archaeological record. His research has focused on investigations of the later Pleistocene evolution of hunter-gatherers' behaviors in sub-Saharan Africa through experimental archaeology, lithic analysis, and the recovery of new field data. Um, today, he'll be talking about a theme which he has been researching on in the last few years uh, um, about the lithic miniaturization versus microliths in human evolution studies. Over to you, Justin. Looking forward to your talk now. All right. Uh, thanks, Ramya. <laughs> thanks, Marietta. And it's lovely to be with you all today. I'm going to switch over to screen sharing here. Give me a second. Okay, are the slides coming across okay? Yes, perfectly, thanks. All right. <clears throat> Um, well, good morning, everyone. It's morning here in the States, afternoon to all of you out there. And thanks to the South African Archaeological Society Student Congress for the invite today. Um, it's a great honor and a great privilege to be able to talk to be able to talk to South African students. I don't get to do it very often, although it is where my heart lies and um, where my career began. So it's lovely to be back with you. And just to reiterate that my name is Justin Pogeter and I'm a Paleolithic archaeologist. I study the evolution of human behavior in the deepest part of the archaeological record uh, through the study of stone tools. And I'm an assistant professor at NYU, um, where you're all most, uh, most welcome to come and visit any day that you find yourself in New York City. Um, I also currently direct the African Paleo Sciences Laboratory, where we do a bunch of experimental research. We run field projects in South Africa. Um, and uh, I'm an honorary research affiliate with the University of Johannesburg and Wits University, where I work closely with my South African colleagues to make all of this research happen. So today we're going to be talking about uh, a bit of a deep dive into a slightly complex issue, but nonetheless a very important one for understanding our behavioral evolution as a species and a group of species and even different genuses, um, and mostly about how we make and use things and why we make decisions about the things we make and use um, and how those processes have evolved. Now, before we get kick-started, I just wanted to kind of prime you on what I think are two of anthropology's big questions. Now, in the US, we call anthropology the collection of archaeology and social cultural anthropology under one big umbrella. And so we're, and primatology and linguistic studies. Um, in South Africa, we might call this more sort of paleosciences big questions or archaeology's big questions. Um, if we are speaking to our colleagues who study primates, but the biggest kinds of questions we can ask about human evolution are first, you know, how do we differ from other primates? How are we different from chimpanzees and gorillas, from other monkeys? Um, and what does this tell us about our evolution as a species and what makes us special and what makes us similar to these other organisms? And secondly, why do we do things differently from one another? 
you know, why do we have this incredible behavioral diversity that today characterizes our species around the world? Um, where does it come from and what drives it? You know, there's no you know, in, innate reason for us to be so different um, unless we consider the context in which we've evolved. And for me, these are the two big questions that really drive anthropological research. And archaeologists fit into this quite nicely because we have this beautiful record that tells us about firstly how we've come to evolve differently from other um, primates and secondly how we've come to evolve differences from each other um, across space and time. So we're going to follow those two big questions. We're going to try and to some degree answer them, um, although it's a career's worth of work to do this properly. But we're going to be doing this in the talk today that follows the, 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 this basic three-part structure. In the beginning, I'm going to be talking to you about a process called technological miniaturization, which is an important one associated with our species. Um, well, then once we're done with that, we'll be talking a little bit about how these things we call microliths uh, differ from a process, a technological process, which I call lithic miniaturization and why they're different from each other and why that's important. And lastly, we're gonna be asking why did ancient humans miniaturize their stone tools in the first place um, in different times and different places. And by doing answering that third question, we're going to be answering one of these big anthropological questions, why humans are different from each other and um, how those differences have evolved. I'm gonna be using a little bit of jargon today um you know happy to clarify any of these concepts in the future when you do watch these this talk but you know some of the basic ones are are what a hominin is so a hominin is basically the group consisting of modern humans that's homo sapiens us extinct human species and all our immediate ancestors including members of the genera homo australopithecines paranthropines and the illustrious autopithecus um Lithic miniaturization refers to the systematic production and use of small stone tools, sometimes tiny stone tools. I'll use these acronyms MYA, just so I don't have to write out a whole bunch of zeros in my slides. Um, that stands for million years ago, and KYA, which stands for thousand years ago. Um, so you can always refer back to the slide if you get a little bit lost with the terminology. But you know, before we dive too deep into the archaeology, I wanted to take a step back and just ask, you know, how has technology influenced your life? Like, what are the things that you make and use, or perhaps just use, um, that have most impacted your lives in terms of technology? Now, while you think about that answer, I'm going to predict that most people will come up with something that relates to either cell phones, computers like laptops, or something in the biomedical fields, like most recently vaccines that are basically you know, at the forefront of our fight with COVID-19 and other kinds of viruses that have been devastating on the human species. And these are all forms of technology and they've impacted and influenced our lives in incredible ways. So I'm willing to bet that most of your answers to this, this question somehow converge on one of these uh, different kinds of technologies. And while they may seem really big in terms of their impacts on our societies and our evolution, they actually come down to some really fundamental tiny building blocks. Cell phones and laptops and computers are comprised of these tiny microchips that have essentially accelerated this kind of technology and enabled it to be so small and so powerful in such a short amount of time, you know, just the last few hundred years, and we've really catapulted in terms of um, our computer technologies. And then nanotechnology has enabled things like vaccines and other kinds of biomedical research to take such huge leaps in such short amounts of time. So these tiny miniature elements of our technological systems have really been at the forefront of why technology or how technology has come to dominate our lives. And so it's pretty important that we understand where this ability to make these tiny things comes from. It seems like it's quite a recent phenomenon, um, but it actually has very ancient roots. And to understand the big picture of miniature systems, we also need to understand how they have influenced our evolution in many different domains. You know, from our hands, which have clearly evolved to use and grasp tiny implements with high precision, 
to our cognitive systems, which rely very heavily on the trading and interpretation of tiny implements like rings, which are symbolic devices, uh, to our ability to make and use things that function in our daily lives, like chopsticks here, which depend upon a very specific kind of hand morphology. And then eventually to our future, which, as I've mentioned already, is dependent on these tiny technologies that are you know, packed into our computers and our vaccines and our other kinds of medications that are revolutionizing how we live and, and where we live. Now, one of the big questions we have to ask of this miniaturization process of technological miniaturization is, is it a distinctly human phenomenon? Is it something that only we do that no other animal alive on the planet today does? Well, humans make and use technology on a smaller scale relative to their body than any other known animal. And that's pretty clear by the examples that I've already showed you. Now, apes and monkeys don't use small tools with this kind of dedicated uh, thumb pad to finger pad precision grip um, as extensively as we do. And you can see the ape hand here. What apes do with their hands is when they do try to grasp things that are very small, they grasp them in a pinch-like manner like this, mostly because their thumb is really big, as are their, their fingers. Humans, when they grasp tiny things, they do it with the tips of their fingers. Now, that's an evolved capacity that only we have and that our ape relatives don't. And so this answers one of the questions, how are humans different uh, from other apes? Now, superficially, this, the kinds of stone tools that chimpanzees and other non-human primates use to crack open nuts in the wild, as you can see here with this chimpanzee, do not seem to be very large. You know, they're not using giant anvils, um, for example. However, if we put these objects into proportion to their body size, these kinds of percusses, like something used to pound rocks and nuts, would be about the same size as a ceramic brick for a human, as you can kind of see here, a very big one, um, as you can see in this, this sketch over here. And they're essentially much larger than any known or commonly used nut cracking tool that humans would use. You know, we use little hammers to do these kinds of tasks. So it's pretty clear that in the wild, when chimpanzees use tools, they use pretty big ones. You know, they're not going after the kinds of miniaturized precision tools that have become a hallmark of our species. So it seems like to some degree, technological miniaturization is a distinctly human phenomenon. However, to really answer this question in more detail, we've kind of got to go back in time a little bit into the fossil record to see if any of our ancestors had the ability to do what we do with objects. Now, if we look at the hands of our earliest ancestors, uh, this is an example of Littlefoot, which you'll all know fairly well, that dates to somewhere between 3.7 and 2.2 million years ago. It's an Australopithecine, it's a hominin, and its hand shows a limited ability for precision gripping. It's not designed in the same way that ours are, which you can see on the right-hand side here, the human hand, modern human hand, has this ability to precisely grab things, to thread needles, to hold car keys, and also at the same time to do things very powerfully, like what we call a three-jaw chuck, throw a ball like a baseball or, or bowl a cricket ball. You know, these are uniquely human capabilities to go from precise to power with a single hand. Littlefoot's hand looks much more like a chimpanzee's hand, a long thumb, very long curved fingers that probably grasped small things in that pincer-like manner. So it's not to say that Littlefoot didn't grab small things and use them, small tools, but it seems like it had a very limited ability to do them. And when it did them, it probably wasn't able to use them with great force. So the answer to the question, is this a uniquely human phenomenon? Seems to be, well, a bit of a mix. Yes, probably something that we've evolved quite uniquely, but it probably has a deep ancestry amongst our earliest hominin relatives in which they might have used these, these tiny kinds of tools occasionally, but not have been as dependent upon them as we are. So the next big question we ask then is how did this unique ability of ours to miniaturize tools, to make these tiny implements and to use them evolve? Where did it come from? And to answer this question, we kind of have to look at the archaeological record, which is this beautiful, well-preserved, in some cases, 
record of human behavior and technology that goes back to over 3 million years in Africa, that is. Now, if we want to study stone tools from this record, which are these very durable, hard objects that preserve on nearly every habitable landmass on the planet where humans have lived, uh, we can do this to try and figure out when miniature tools entered into the archaeological record. Now, to do this, we need some kinds of systems for understanding what these, these tools look like and for recording and classifying them, counting them, so that we know roughly when they occur and how frequently they occur. One system for doing this is this mode scheme, which is quite common in, in the archaeological literature. And essentially, it sets up a scheme of technological development through time with mode one being the oldest and mode five being the youngest. Mode five is also commonly known as microlithization or microliths, which most archeologists assume are the last development in stone tool technology. The latest and greatest thing that our ancestors did with stone after many millions of years of using it. Now this might seem intuitive that like the most advanced thing comes last in the sequence. That's kind of normal for human thinking about trends through time. But there are many problems with this kind of classification system that might not be obvious on the surface. And the first is that hominins, humans and our ancestors, have been making miniaturized stone tools for over a million years, if we actually look at the evidence. And on the left hand side here, you can see a whole bunch of examples of these kinds of tiny tools some of which date to over a million years ago in Africa and in other parts of the world, especially in countries like Israel. So we have evidence that our ancestors for a very long time had been making and using these tiny tools and that miniature technologies weren't just the last development that we did, they were kind of sprinkled throughout our evolution. And so it becomes a challenge now for us to ask, why did they do this when they did? and how frequently did they? Now, one of the big challenges with answering that question is that archaeologists cannot really agree on what a microlith is. So if we want to use that modes one to five system, where microliths are this thing that we identify at the end of the sequence, we have to agree on what a microlith is. And unfortunately, archaeologists haven't been able to do that. They call things that are shaped into geometric forms microliths. Other archaeologists call things that are blunted on one end, microliths. Some archaeologists call long elongated stone tools, microliths. And others call very small modified and shaped stone tools, microliths. All these things are microliths? That's kind of confusing. Now imagine we had to do this if we studied birds, right? You know, we've got a whole bunch of diversity here. Is it enough to just call all these things birds? and to be done with it. Maybe for some people, if you just wanted to communicate the fact that there are birds on the screen, but if we really wanted to understand the phenomenon of what birds are, we need a classification system that can actually accurately describe their differences, not just call them all birds and be done with it. So we need a new approach focused, not on the, focused on the process rather than just the products themselves. And if we continue our bird analogy, we need a, uh, what, what bird scientists or avian scientists have come up with is a system that describes the process of bird evolution through time, which has eventually linked birds back to dinosaurs, as you can see in the scheme here, rather than just trying to study birds as objects. You know, we're interested in the process of their evolution. That tells us really interesting things about how they've come to be all these different forms around the world. And it's the thing that Darwin focused on when he first described finches in his travels in the Galapagos Islands. And that led him to the theory of evolution as, as we've historically known it. Um, so process rather than product is the way forward here. And we need a new system that enables us to do this. Now, traditional approaches have focused on typological questions traditional approaches to studying these tiny stone tools. That is, they focused on microliths, how to describe these objects. And stone tools are static, they're dead things. They occurred you know, many hundreds of thousands of years ago. They don't speak for themselves, we have to speak for them. 
we have to describe the processes that led to them. And some archaeologists care about what microliths are, but not many. Many of you today didn't even probably know what a microlith was before coming to this talk. Now, if we switch over to a new approach that focuses on processes, which is lithic miniaturization, the questions become about what is it behind the stone tools that led people to make them? What is it that they used to make them in the first place as well? The focus then becomes not on stone tools necessarily, but on the behaviors that lie behind them, which are actually dynamic things. Humans are dynamic organisms and understanding their behavior becomes a dynamic exercise. And it's a question that not just some archeologists care about, but all paleoscientists really do because it tells us about how we're different from other primates. And it tells us how we're different from each other because we can start to flesh out those differences in time and space and figure out what it is that drove humans to use these things. So before we dive too deep into the data and examples of what lithic miniaturization is, we gotta take a step back and just look at the process itself. And lithic miniaturization refers to the systematic that, that is repetitive and intentional, making and using of small flakes and bladelets from small cores. And by flake I, and a bladelet, I just basically mean things that are either very long and thin or quite wide and a little fatter. Those are the essential key differences. When these tiny tools become retouched or modified by humans, Archaeologists have typically called them microliths, and I think that's a good place for them. My, however, we can also imagine that they were used without being modified. You know, just like a paper clip in the office or at your desk, you might take something without really modifying it very much and just using it. That can be the case for these tiny tools too. And these are really small. Um, just to reiterate, these tiny tools are um, uh, try and show you here. There should be a scale at the bottom here. This tool is about a centimeter in size. Uh, and just to show you that they can easily be overlooked if we don't actually focus um, on trying to find them in big stone tool assemblages where there are lots of little chips and uh, pieces of debris. Now, there are lots of different ways to miniaturize toolkits to go small with technology. And these are two examples, and I'll just show you a quick video of each of them. The first is called freehand reduction, where you actually hold a nodule of rock in your hand. And this is kind of how it works, if it works. Um, so you can see it's kind of a complex process. You have to, you know, your hands are in danger all the time um, and you have to know exactly where to hit. A slightly easier way to do this is called <laughs> You can see that, you know, it's a little bit more straightforward. You basically just have to hammer down on the piece of rock from above, but you can see all those tiny pieces of stone coming off that, that lump of rock. They're all really useful. Um, and they're both ways of making these tiny stone tools that we can study in the archeological record to figure out when and where people did these, uh, use these processes through time. Now with this research framework in mind, lithic miniaturization, we can ask two big questions relating to it. The first is how does lithic miniaturization vary across space and time? Did our ancestors use the same techniques all the time, or does it vary depending on where they were living and when they were living? And once we have that in place, we can ask what factors might explain this dif these differences? When, uh, under what conditions might different choices of miniaturization have been made? And that then starts to get us to that second big question in anthropology, which is how do humans differ, differ from each other and why? Now, the hallmark of a mature science, that is a science like physics or chemistry, is its ability to make justified predictions about evidence. To say, if I drop this, let me take a coin, if I drop this coin like that, it's gonna hit the floor as you heard. I can make a prediction about that because you know the science of physics has told me about a process called gravity. 
Now that's a mature science. That process is well known and we can make predictions about it. We can make predictions about when it will fail like up in space because of the maturity of, of the science of physics. Now, archaeology is a maturing science. We're kind of getting there, the ability to make predictions about the archaeological record. It's tricky because it's um, there are a lot of variables. But I've made three predictions about key moments in our ancestors' use of lithic miniaturization, when these tiny tools probably should pop up and increase in frequency uh, and in different ways. And these are, the first is, our use of expedient, uh, our reliance on expedient cutting tasks for butchering animals. You know, this is a process that really starts to increase in frequency um, greater than 1 million years ago. Sorry, that sign should be the other way around. Um, when our ancestors shift from being power scavengers to being meat eaters or relying primarily on, on meat eating. But even if they were scavengers, they could have used these tiny tools to butcher up carcasses. The second is with the invention of high-speed weaponry, which we know occurred sometime after 100,000 years ago. High-speed weapons need light tips at their, at their ends. Otherwise, they just basically plunk, fall straight down. And so with the evolution of high-speed weaponry, we should find humans using smaller stone tools. And the lastly, last is with increases in human mobility, our ability to move very large distances and possibly with restrictions on our ability to get resources, that is rocks to make stone tools. These are processes that largely start to increase in frequency after about 60,000 years in the archeological record as we start to get population densities increasing. So humans move in different ways and those ways start to impact our access to resources. And so we're more likely to try and carry small light technologies with us moving around anyone try to do it with a very heavy object it's not easy so you're trying to uh, optimize that by carrying small things and if you're stuck for raw material you don't have a lot of rocket your availability you're going to try and use as much of it as you can and so these processes should again lead to a different kind of increase in miniaturization after about 60,000 years ago so let's take a look at the evidence now in support of these. In terms of type point one, the need for small disposable and sharp cutting edges amongst our earliest ancestors. There's pretty good evidence that small flakes made of things like obsidian in Ethiopia start to increase in frequency at around 1.7 million years ago. They're, interestingly, they're made in landscapes where big blocks of obsidian are available. So people were choosing to make tiny tools probably because they function very well for butchery. They have a lot of sharp edges on them. So prediction met. The second is that we find after, you know, sometime between a million and a little bit later, uh, 500,000 years ago, people starting to actually haft these small stone tools at sites in Israel. Um, you know, people have argued that they could be evidence of, of um, either holding them in hands or attaching them to handles like you see in this image here. There's also pretty clear uh, what we call micro wear, tiny wear patterns on the edges of these tools, which suggest that they were used for butchery at some point in the past. So it does seem like when butchery becomes a big deal in our evolution, small, tiny, sharp flakes do become a big part of the stone tool record. Now that doesn't mean that they're there all the time. They just kind of cycle in and out when these activities become important. Now, what about time point two and the origins of high-speed weaponry? As I said, projecting something at a high speed places very strong pressures on humans to make tiny tools to go on the tips of these uh, implements to, so that they can travel further. Now, historical examples of high-speed weapons, like this um, Bushman arrowhead that you see here from the 19th century in Southern Africa, demonstrates that they were using these tiny tools at the tips of their, of their weapons because they were actually arrows, and we know that for a fact. So this historic analogy does actually prove that um, high-speed weaponry creates this demand for tiny tools. But complex weapons such as the bow and arrow and spear throw and dart, things that move at high speeds, um, they cut more effectively. Um, so there's a reason to put stone at the end of these kinds of, of weapons. Um, 
And there's a reason that those stones should have been smaller, as I explained already. In 2008, we began the first experiments to test this hypothesis that these tiny tools could be used uh, as high-speed weapon components. And we tested these back tools that you see depicted here. Um, and they actually came out pretty well. They worked extremely efficiently and effectively at hunting animals. Um, these are experimental animals in our case. Uh, so they proved experimentally that we could do this. Now the trick became finding the archaeological evidence that shows uh, that people actually did this in the past. And that's what my colleague Malis Lombard and Lynn Wadley um, have done at sites like Sibudu Cave, where at around about 60,000 years ago, these tiny pieces of quartz were modified into small miniature back tools. And Marlies has done a lot of work on this to document different kinds of evidence that show that they were used possibly as arrowheads. And so the Sabudu evidence confirms that when high-speed weaponry enters into the archaeological record somewhere around 60,000 years ago, that people don't make giant stone tools to use it. They make tiny miniaturized ones. So time point two prediction is a check. Now, what about the last one? Increases in mobility and resource constraints less than 60,000 years ago. Well, to answer this question, we need a different set of data. And I draw some of this data from one of the sites that I'm busy excavating down in the Southern Cape called Bornplas Cave. And Bornplas is in an interesting position because it's nearby a coastline that was drowned after the last ice age at about 17,000 years ago. And all that coastal area there that you see in the brown on this figure was lost. It's an area of about 80,000 square kilometers. And it pushed people to move off this coastline and into these mountains where Bornplas Cave is. And as they did this, it increased population densities in this area. So if indeed population density and changes in how people move and the scarcity of raw materials that result from those processes does impact the miniaturization, as I predicted, Bone Plus Cave should show the signals after the last glacial maximum or the last ice age and in our planet's climate history. Now we can see this is just a schematic showing you basically what it looks like when that ocean comes and drowns the Southern Cape coastline. And you can see people moving onto the coastline here and then further inland as resources become scarcer and their need to survive becomes more severe and they end up at sites like Born Plus. Now, what do we find when we, and, and the interesting thing about Born Plus is that it's one of the last places to live before you get into the semi-desert area, the Karoo, which is really hard, a hard place to live. So at Born Plus, this is what the stone tools looked like at that time. As you can see, they're tiny. Some of them actually fit on the tip of my finger here. Um, and we believe that they were probably used uh, as the tips of high-speed weapons, again, like arrows. But interest, so the lithic evidence seems to match the prediction that during in periods of increased population density, humans would miniaturize their tools as a response to trying to conserve rock in the landscape. But interestingly, we also find that people's diets changed to focus on smaller and harder to capture foods like tortoises and hares at this time, which suggests some kind of stress in the diet probably driven by the fact that they can't go and forage as much as they did in the wider landscape, most likely because there's more people. And so they start to uh, forage around these, these harder to get things like rabbits and hares, which if anyone's tried to hunt a rabbit, it's not an easy thing to do. And butchering it and eating it, it's a lot of work for not a lot of meat. Um, but they also start making other kinds of miniature implements like ostrich eggshell beads, which can be strung up and used to trade but are generally made in contexts in which there's a lot of people in the landscape that you want to communicate with. So it's not just stone tools that become miniature at this time after the, the last ice age in Southern Africa when population densities are increasing. It's a whole bunch of different kinds of technologies. So it seems like a concerted effort to conserve and communicate things at this time. So time point three, check mark. So if we go back to the beginning, you know, there are some concluding thoughts here. The first is that it seems like miniaturization is a uniquely human thing because of this hand morphology that we have. Although apes probably make and use tiny things as well, but without the kind of precision and efficiency that we do. 
So it's probably safe to call this a kind of human unique phenomenon. Studying Michaelis doesn't do much for us in terms of understanding this phenomenon because no one can agree on what they are. To do this, we need a more process-driven system, and that is lithic miniaturization, which focuses on how people make things and why they make things. And when we do this, we can look at things like butchery and the evolution of hafting. We can look at mobility and the evolution of, of human responses to raw material scarcity. And as we've seen, they all show pretty clear predictions about when lithic miniaturization should increase in our evolution um, that is actually met by the archaeological data. And so to come back, always keep in mind when you're doing your research that the goal is not to try and get too deep into a very narrow question. That's interesting, but you always want to keep in mind the big questions that drive your work. And from my perspective, two of them are again, how do we differ from other primates, which makes us different from other apes? And secondly, why and how do we do things differently from each other? And how does that evolve through time? And so keep these in mind when you're doing your work. And I think you'll always be able to communicate very widely about the stuff you do and why it's interesting. And thank you for your time today. It's been a pleasure. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation, Justin. It's it's really interesting to think about, like you said, like the focusing on the processes that led to miniaturization and not just looking at the tools themselves, but you know the processes that go into their development. Um, so Ramya, can I open the floor for questions? Do you have anything uh, in particular on your mind to ask? Thanks, thanks, Dustin. Um, like you said, like the importance of understanding the processes and it is really important and not just the outcome. So you mentioned about experimental archeology span in there as well. Um, you know, like how does um, the human biology um, over time, you know, the hand side, the dexterity, the hand-eye coordination, how does the contemporary understanding of these biological aspects, you know, influence the result or, or the understanding in the Pleistocene record? Because we don't have exact um, understanding, but our understanding from present has a huge implication on the archeological record. What are the drawbacks or the challenges when we try to you know, understand such phenomena as the processes as you mentioned? Yeah, um, yeah. It's a, it's a, it, it is a tricky and challenging research framework um, to try and model ancient hominin biology and behavior using modern humans today. And I think your question is, are there any like pitfalls when doing it? Um, are there any assumptions that we make that could be issues? Um, yeah, you know, we need to be very clear about the parameters of our experiments, what we're testing and why. Um, experimental archaeology is exciting and it's it's become a big part of archaeology from being a fringe thing that some people did to nowadays being something everyone does almost. Um, and with that has come a growing awareness that we need to control some things in experiments and let other things vary, right? Um, that's the design of a good experiment. Now, with understanding biocultural evolution, that is how is the body related to things and how do those two things evolve? You've got complexity on two fronts. The thing that you make and use is complex and then how you make and use it is, is, a, is a complexity. Um, with these kinds of experiments, what we tend to try and focus on is the aspects of either the anatomy or cognition that are likely to have a long evolutionary record and that are unlikely to have changed very much in short amounts of time within our recent evolution. So for example, the hand, you know, the hand is clearly something that has a lot of shared morphology through time. 
and I've kind of shown you that with some of the chimp finger morphologies, they look, you know, Littlefoot's hand looks kind of like it's got some shared features with ours, but it's got this really long elongated morphology that doesn't um, lend itself to precision gripping. Now we can model that hand. We can create a robot that can literally use tools like, like Littlefoot would and get it to do a whole bunch of tasks, cut things, pound things, slice things. And that tells us a lot about what those tools were likely used for. We can also take modern people and put them under different constraints so that the body is unable to move in modern ways, but more like uh, ancestral ways. Uh, so we've done this when we look at the impact of the shoulder and the elbow and its evolution on stone tool making, in which case we strap people up and they're kind of got a restricted range of motions that more mimic an australopithecine uh, biomechanics and less a modern human. That's another way to do it. Um, so either we use, you know, we take humans out of the equation, we just use robots, um, or we kind of modify humans a little bit to mimic, or we do other experiments where we look at how people think and how that impacts the things they make and use. That's another aspect of this biocultural process. Um, and there we focus on things like working memory, for example, which is a cognitive faculty that probably has a long evolutionary ancestry in our species. It's not something that just we do, and it's not something that popped up yesterday, but it has, you know, a deep evolutionary uh, uh, legacy. And so we can look at people today and how they use working memory to understand how our ancestors did, because it's something that was probably there amongst our ancestors too, in some way or another. Um, but doing these experiments, with many different kinds of populations is important um, so that you don't get biased. You know, so we've done a lot of this work with North American populations, um, college students, and that's a bias, right? They learn in some ways, they move in some ways. And I'm super keen to try and do more of this work with other populations around the world to see you know, that, that, that true diversity um, that is out there and, and use that to help us to better understand the evolution of these processes. Um, but it's a big complex kind of research. Uh, but you know, the, the, the most interesting things generally are. Um, ah, thank you. Thank you for that response, Justin. Um, from my side, um, <laughs> your talk actually made me think in terms of miniaturization, how it's, it's still taking place with our tools today. And I instantly thought of my, my little Leatherman tool, which I mean, Leathermans are usually quite, you know, larger than this. And I think this is a pretty good example of miniaturization. And I think my question relates to how, how much more do you think we can miniaturize our, our tools before they kind of, before they reach the, the maximum amount of miniaturization that can take place to still be functional. Now, how yep. small can we go? It's like with, with cell phones, for example, you know, I often think in the future, how, how will a cell phone look? Because we've got thinner and we've got smaller in some senses, although screen sizes have you know, increased, but have we kind of reached the ideal size in terms of, of certain technologies? So that's kind of like my first question. Do you think there's kind of like a cap or a maximum in terms of technology? And then the other was more of a comment where we were talking about how with experimental archaeology, um, there's now a drive towards considering processes and then also like the, the planning and preparation and practice that goes into, you know, developing lithics and it's not just about just smashing two pieces of rock together and saying okay this is how they did it but also to start thinking about you know what were some of the cognitive processes that went ahead of that you know did they you know go out and collect materials and that was kind of like a phase like guys day one today we collect materials tomorrow we you know complete the first few steps and then we start retouching and then we start hafting 
and all the plans and preparation that went into that. So that's also a very interesting field of study. Um, and then also on a different note, because this got me thinking about other things as well, is um, in terms of how the creation of stone tools led to biological developments in terms of our, you know, our motor skills and the shape of our hands and kind of like in almost like in a feedback loop, we can develop tools based on our physical abilities, but then the tools themselves also lead to our development in terms of, you know, what we, what we can do with our hands. Um, it's like other biological adaptations in terms of, um, you know, muscle size and strength. I'm thinking about um, if you look at the skeletons of some of the, the ancient um, Roman gladiators who had, you know, muscular adaptations in the one arm because they were, you know, they used a spear and they were right-handed and you can actually on their skeletons, on the bones, see, you know, the, the development of, you know, the bones in terms of handling larger muscles, you know, there's that adaptation to the skeleton. So do you think some of the like really, um, like almost like um, habitual stone tool makers in, in early communities, like the guys who were really good at it and did it every single day, like what other biological adaptations might have been isolated to those individuals mm. all right well there's a lot to unpack there yes um, sorry <laughs> no that's the goal of a good Kinda talk wiggled. right <laughs> good talks get you thinking so i'm glad um i'll try to be as efficient as i can moving through this um yeah in terms of thresholds in the tool in the technology you know with every every technological development comes with costs and benefits right um, we know this from your good example of the of the cell phones. Um, you know, things seem to be getting a lot smaller with with the iPhone, and then all of a sudden, boom! We've got this giant screen, and um, that came. You know, the the miniaturization and the functionality of those phones came at the cost of batteries, right? You know, it just the batteries just kept on getting worse and worse. Um, and so it took a threshold in battery production to really allow them to then expand out again. But I think the secret behind those screens is also that they got to, they had to put bigger batteries into the phones to, to basically keep them functioning the way that people got used to. And so that cost benefit equation with the iPhone has gone back to the bigger side of things because functionality drives the size threshold right it's you know in some cases things get tiny 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 up until a point where it's no longer possible to pack everything into that small package and you need to start going back up again um so the cool thing about lithic miniaturization rather than sort of like microliths for example is that what you're able to do is is measure a phenomenon through time and its fluctuations and that's the point i was trying to make with the inflection points is that it's not a constant through our evolution. It's really a, a fluctuating process in which our ancestors engaged. And we see things getting big after they get small. And, and, and it's, 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 a, it's a curve, you know, a constantly changing curve. And any of your, your more savvy students of the South African archeological record might know that after that Born Plus um, blip after the last ice age, in you know between what we call the, the the terminal pleistocene just as we're coming out of this long period of of um ice age in uh, non-ice age um sequencing we get into the holocene the last ten thousand years a very sort of warm and relatively stable period and at that point ancient tool makers in south africa go big with their technologies they start making giant flakes big cores it doesn't look anything like the bone plus stuff um, and so it shows you why that mode scheme doesn't really work. You know, it's not just a progression to things that are small and then we're done. It's about cycling. And I, you know, no one really knows why they went big with their stuff in the early Holocene after the, the that Born Plus blip. Um, it's still a big research question, actually. And, and I think it's out there for someone to figure out what exactly happened with this material at the early Holocene. But it shows you that maybe it's about the, the costs of going small um, maybe it just got too costly to try and fit these tiny things into tools where they would be useful because you actually have to attach these tiny things to handles most of the time 
and that demands things like glue and wood and that actually takes the time making the tools is easy uh, it's it's making the hafts that takes a long time so maybe that cost became too great and the technology sort of like went out of favor but humans are also very fickle we we love fashion right um you know one day we're into this and the next day we're into that and so things change because of trends to people just don't like to do things one way and they shift so that's another process we have to try and study in the archaeological record is cultural evolution is the choice factor uh, which is just random right it's not driven by function it's not driven it's just driven by by preference and bias from who we learn and that's a whole nother talk um, so yeah, I think that's a good point, cost and benefits, and, and I think there are thresholds, but we have to try and design experiments to get at them and, and, and look at the archaeological record in a certain way. Um, you know, then, um, you know, in terms of the, um, you know, the bio aspects and um, looking at the effect of, of individual differences, I think is really, a key thing and you, you pulled out the, the idea that um, strong individuals might you know what is it about them or other aspects about them um, that, that could have made them more successful um, you know I think we we've we've designed some experiments to try and look at what actually makes people good at making stone tools um, individuals because that is the source of evolution is is individual differences and we found effects that show strong people are good. Like if you're strong, you are able to make stone tools more, um, more of them. You're able to bash through a rock more effectively. But that effect goes away when people are taught. And so when we teach people how to make stone tools, stronger individuals become just like weak individuals in their abilities. And what that shows you is that teaching is the universal leveling mechanism. And that's likely the case amongst our ancestors too, because they lived in social groups. They weren't isolated. They, they're primates, you know, just like we are. So we need each other. So it's quite likely that, yeah, there were strong people in the past. And I would add to your guys, I would add the girls, because I think women are probably very much tool makers um, a lot of the time. And strong individuals probably did do well, but I think as soon as we became dependent on learning, to succeed. And that's probably quite early in our evolution, probably over a million years ago, we were teaching each other and learning that the effect of strength goes away a little bit. And we become a little bit more of a homogenous group whose success depends on how able we are to actually learn from each other, not just how strong we are. Um, and that's probably, again, something that makes us quite unique relative to other primate species who depend a lot on strength and brute force to get things done. I, I like that you added there that, um, you know, some of some of the girls were also probably good um, stone tool manufacturers. Uh, we had a, a, a course a few years ago. Um, we, would, we, did, we did a bit of experimental archaeology. We had a, a colleague of ours who, you know, brought a, a variety of different materials and we were busy making stone tools. And, you know, some of the girls really um, kind of unearthed their inner cave women because they, <laughs> they, was, they, they just made some excellent tools. And um, uh, we oh, managed yeah. even to, uh, we had a, a, a bush pig carcass that we actually... Um, dissected using just the stone tools that we made and you know two of the girls they were probably the most excited about the whole activity <laughs> sitting there cutting up a bush pig with their with their stone tools and you know. yeah no there yeah and if you look at, at modern people today the the last few remaining groups who still use stone tools uh, a lot of it is 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 women actually um and uh I think the bias of like man, the toolmaker is historical. Um, it's something that crept into our work about a hundred years ago, and we've been struggling to shake it off. You know? Yeah. Uh, so, um, Rami, you've got a question or a comment? Yeah, I, I do have uh, another question for Justin here. Um, I was just reminded of one of your research on the pre contact North American miniaturized. Uh, weapon manufacturing uh, or the process. Um, mm -hmm. Could you like share some 
you know relatable or contrasting aspects as compared to say the southern african um san khoisan hunter gatherers like what are those certain aspects which struck you are like very important to understand the concept of uh, miniaturization yeah i think the um this is work i've done with colleagues at kent state university and 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 some brilliant experimental archaeologists who are able to make lots of really cool kinds of stone tools that we used in this experiment to um, test a hypothesis that people would go very small with their kinds of with their weapons when faced with population pressures and resource scarcities like i described from bone plus um, but these are people who in a period in north american prehistory in the last five thousand years um, had become settled communities. They practiced some forms of agriculture and they didn't have the option to pick up and move like the Bourne Plus hunter gatherers did, you know, in that very, very poor animation that I showed you, um, you saw how the groups kind of move off the coast and inland. Now that's an option for our hunter gatherer ancestors, pick up and move. If things get bad, you just move. Um, in the last few thousand years, that's become less of an option for our ancestors because we depend on land for uh, for our surplus increase. And that's the case in North America with these Mississippian groups. So we wanted to see if under the situation of not being able to move to get to different resources and faced with population and political pressures, which can actually be tracked at that time period in North America, it's quite interesting. There's lots of data. Um, what did people do with their weapon systems? You know, did they go big? Because that's one option is just to, you know, bludgeon your way through the problem. Or did they become very precise uh, uh, hunters? And, you know, so we made a, thousands of these stone tools. We used them in experiments to see if there was a threshold at which they functioned best. And we derived a number there. It's called the TSAT that you'll find in that paper. It just describes how small things need to be to be optimal to function. Um, and it's, we were looking at the kinds of animals that they ate in this period, and mostly it was deer that they're hunting. And we measured the distance between the ribs in a deer to see what the size of point would be that needed to go into the animal to get to a vital organ, like a heart or a lung, to really bring an animal down without poison. And that number became a key marker in the experiments. And we could show that actually tool makers in this period took you know we had this threshold for what it what the minimum function was needed for a tiny tool to dispatch a deer and their tools were a magnitude of uh, below this um so it's pretty clear that they're optimizing their hunting weapons they're going extremely small with their weapon systems um they're high speed they're using bow and arrow but interestingly, they were the same across many different geographical regions. So across different biomes, across different you know, topographies, across North America, the same phenomenon happened. So it seems like it's not so much just about one site and one area. It's about a big process that's affecting a lot of different people, um, driving the size of these tools down. And that's likely, we argue something it's actually political um, that these chieftains are sort of out competing each other for resources and that it eventually ends up in warfare and that these weapon systems become the optimal solutions to dealing with complex conflict when you only have stone. Um, now with the Bushman stuff in South Africa or the, you know, the more recent archaeology, um, they're the, uh, our guys kind of, and, and girls, people always had the option to move um, up until the proto-historical periods where you have the encroachment of the Dutch and you know agriculture in the last 2000 years hunter-gatherers in South Africa always had the option to move um, and it's interesting I think in that case that they did go so small with their weapon systems like that 19th century arrowhead that I showed you um, I think here it's driven more by the need to carry lights and mobile toolkits. Um, and the fact that our groups we know relied heavily on poison um, in their weapon systems. It wasn't just about penetration. It was about just basically getting a tip sharp enough to go into the animal to deliver a poison system, but to make it portable and 
uh, for group, groups that were very mobile. And the importance here is that you can see the products are the same. You know, the, essentially the tools are both kind of small and they in North America and down in South Africa, but the process behind them is completely different. And that's where I think it's important for us to take a step back and say, if we only studied the stone tools, we lose the message, but we got to look at them in context and figure out all the rest of the stuff. You know, what is the environment? What is the social context? If we can, you know, how old are the things? And that gives us the, the ability to untangle two seemingly similar processes on different continents, but that are being driven by completely different human behaviors. Thanks, Justin. Um, Marty, do you have another question before I go to my last one here? No, you can go ahead, sir. <laughs> OK. Um, this is more out on the outreach aspect. So I, will, I came across one of your projects called Archaeology Action Comics Project. Um, could you just share more about this um, project in South Africa that you have been working on? And hopefully you'll be able to materialize soon as well. Uh, yeah, well, we have we have materialized. Yeah, and I'll um, I can actually maybe you could attach a link to the talk or when you do um, air it to the actual comics, people can download them for free. Um, yeah, this is a project that I'm probably of all the work I've done most proud of, um, and it's something we're continuing to do. But basically, we are trying to change the face of archaeology in South Africa and. We're trying to, for a new generation of young South Africans, develop a set of materials that are fun to read, that are engaging, and that present people, careers, and stories that relate to them and their backgrounds, and that is previously disadvantaged groups. So to do that, we developed a set of comic worksheets with an incredible media um, and science communication company called Jive. Um, they do a lot of work in South Africa across the science spectrums. They've worked with um, SCAR, the large telescope project in, in the Karoo. They've worked with COVID-19 outreach, a whole bunch of stuff. Um, and they have a whole team of graphic designers and storytellers. And we brought to them this idea of developing a set of, of, of you know, engaging materials for young South Africans of, uh, um, of different backgrounds and they've been working with us to put together these stories and what they are basically is four page worksheets that um, go out across South Africa to um, a network of science clubs called the Science Baza um, and they reach about 10,000 school children a month and they contain in the beginning of the of the worksheet, a little bit of a story about some aspect of archaeology. We've done one on radiocarbon dating. Um, what is it? You know, what is some of the basic science behind it? Um, there is an activity in each worksheet that the kids can do with minimal input. You don't need a lot of supplies to do them. So, with the radiocarbon dating worksheet, it was like a little excavation that they got to do with an old Coke bottle and layering sand and figuring out how like radiocarbon samples are actually taken. Um, and we then have most importantly, a career section in each worksheet where we highlight figures. Um, we, in the radiocarbon dating worksheet did uh, an incredible set of figures from um, e Timber Labs in Johannesburg um, young black female characters who work on accelerator sciences in South Africa and who have an interest in archaeology. And if, if a student did, they could imagine themselves not just being an archaeologist, but also being an accelerator scientist. Um, and then there's some, you know, fun stuff at the end for the kids, for kids to do too, like word searches and crossword puzzles and stuff. Um, and most recently, we've done one on Joshua Kumbani's work uh, with the bull roarers at Classies. Um, he, you know, we put together this really cool worksheet about how bull roarers, you know, tell us about the ancient evolution of sound. 
and how they depicted in the rock art of South Africa or, and in our excavated materials. Um, we have an activity in that worksheet that shows kids how to make a bull roarer. Um, and then a career section where we feature Joshua and that's meant to focus on like the academic side of things, how you might become an archeologist as an academic. And we realize that, you know, not everyone is able to become an academic and that it's not even realistic that everyone does. And that there are lots of other cool careers that can be done in paleo sciences and with this knowledge. And that's why we try and diversify that careers section. But those are, um, two actual finished projects in this work. Um, the Bull Roarers one is about to come out. We're just kind of finalizing. We translate all these things into um, EC Classa and we're working on other translations to, to make it as uh, accessible as possible. Um, and we're just finalizing those translations on the Bull Roarer one. It'll come out in the next few weeks. And then we have at least two that are ready to go. And we're continuing to work on them. You know, we there's so many topics just like what you, you you're all doing with these lectures um there's so much material out there and it just needs to kind of be packaged in the right way and our mission is to just ideally produce a new generation of south africans who are proud of paleo sciences and and know that it has a face that reflects them and a story that reflects them too um so yeah super proud of that work that, that sounds like like really, really fantastic um, projects that you're busy with with that. And I, th I think that it, it ties in well um, with science communication. You know, how we as archaeologists and paleo scientists can communicate what we are busy doing and the importance of what we're doing and why we're doing it with, you know, a wider community, you know, with people who are interested in the subject and also, you know, interested about knowing more about, you know, these sciences as actual fields of, you know, career paths. I think that's very valuable work. And I think we can actually, if we start on that topic, I think we can sit here for about another half an hour because that's also something that, that I'm passionate about, science communication and, and public engagement and outreach. And I think we might just get you back for, you know, another session just to talk about, about those those projects and the value behind it that would be lovely i'd be honored yeah cool all right Thank everyone you, have a fantastic day further you Good too night. bye bye <laughs>